In this episode of Taking Care of Mom and Dad, how can caregivers be notified quickly in an emergency? How do you sell mom and dad's house when it's time? Is Medicaid right for you or your loved one? And how do you qualify? Welcome to Taking Care of Mom and Dad. 70 million baby boomers are entering the golden years. Unfortunately, those golden years also bring with them serious health, psychological, and emotional challenges, and life becomes complicated in a different way. At this time, the children often become the caregivers. Sometimes they live close by. At other times, they live too far away to be available on call. They have to get the answers to many questions quickly. What is really going on with mom? What are the treatment options? How will this be paid for? How can I manage all of this from far away? These questions and others create uncertainty, fear, and even guilt. Taking Care of Mom and Dad was created to answer these questions and many others. On each episode, experts in healthcare, elder care, finance, law, and psychology focus on the specific questions you want answered. Lou Pirro is a well-known trust and estates and elder care attorney who is also developing a new form of state-of-the-art elder care company. He'll be joining us remotely. So people that can't afford long-term care coverage are facing huge expenses. What are their options? So for the people who just didn't do the plan, and as lawyers, we see these people every day. These are a lot of our clients. They don't have the plan in place and they slip on that banana peel and you know what hits the fan. And here's the progression. Mom breaks a hip. She's in the hospital. She goes in, she gets admitted. She's there for treatment. She may have a surgery. Then she goes to rehabilitation and she gets a certain amount of rehab, a week, two weeks, 20 days. Then she's got a discharge. And then where does mom go? And then you start looking around and say, okay, if we want to bring mom back home, how do we get the care? Where do we find it? And how do we pay for it? And we talked about the insurance options and it's a godsend when you have the insurance to pay at that point in time. It's where the rubber meets the road, as they say. But if you don't, then the program that we have to talk about is Medicaid. And Medicaid is unfortunately a program that's premised upon financial eligibility. And that means that you have to either be poor to get Medicaid or look poor to get Medicaid. And when I say that, I don't do it facetiously. You have to have in place a plan where you have put assets in a position where they're not going to be countable for Medicaid purposes. And we use trusts for that. So Medicaid is the program that will pay for long-term care. It varies again state by state, so you have to know what's available in your state New York is a very rich state in terms of benefits under Medicaid. We have a Medicaid home care program where our clients can get 24 hour a day care. But I talk all around the country with other attorneys and that's a rarity. Very few states have that kind of home care and many states have none. So you have to look at this state by state and meet with a qualified elder law attorney in your neighborhood, in your market, in your town and get a good consultation so that you know what your rights are and what could be available to you if this need arises. Lou, doesn't Medicare cover long-term care expenses? That's one of the myths that's out there. We see a lot of people that come in and expect that Medicare is gonna pay for them. They do surveys, AARP, is, we work closely with AARP, they do surveys all across the country. And their last survey said that 63% of seniors believe that they were covered for long-term care by Medicare. That's not the program. Unfortunately, they came in at the same time in 1965. Medicare was the, the health care program for seniors, and Lyndon Johnson brought that in and said, never again will seniors in America have to worry about health care. Well, times have changed. Demographics have changed. Longevity, cost of care, all of those factors have changed. So now long-term care has been split out of Medicare, and the only program is Medicaid. And again, that's a means-tested program. 
What does Medicaid cover? This varies state by state, and it depends on what your state legislature and governor have enacted in terms of the benefits. Again, some states have very rich Medicaid programs. Some states don't. Almost every state covers nursing home care. So that's the end game. If you end up in a nursing home and you're down below the asset threshold, and in most states that asset threshold is $2,000. You have to get below $2,000 of countable assets in order to qualify for Medicaid. New York's is higher. It's $15,000 or $15, now $540. And each state may be a little bit different. Most states are $2,000. If you get down to that level, Medicaid will pay your nursing home bill. In some states, it may have some limited assisted living coverage. And in other states, especially like New York, California has a home care program. Others have waivered services programs. The problem in most states is that those programs run out of money very early in the year. And so people can't access the coverage, even though it's on the books and there is a program there. The funds are not available in those states to cover home health care. I've been doing this a long time and I ask every one of my clients and when I do seminars, I ask the room, where would you want to be if you needed care? Where would you want to be taken care of? And almost every hand goes up when I say in your own home. And aging in place is a goal, but it takes a plan in order to do it successfully. So do the requirements differ in each state? Yes, absolutely. Eligibility is a state specific issue with federal guidelines, complicated system, because Medicaid is paid for by both federal dollars and state dollars. So the federal government has a body of law that sets the broad parameters for Medicaid, and then each state gets to choose its program within those parameters. When we look at eligibility, there are two different prongs to it. You have to look at income and assets, and each state will give you a certain amount of income as an allowance, some are called income cap states, some are income spend down states, but you really need to get granular here with someone in your state, a qualified elder law attorney in your state who can walk you through the eligibility process and let you know what those parameters are. The other thing that states differ on is how they treat certain assets. For example, we practice in New York, we practice in Florida, in both of those states, Retirement accounts, IRAs and 401ks, are exempt for Medicaid purposes. We practice in Massachusetts. They're not exempt. You have to take extra steps to, to do something with IRAs in those states in order to qualify for Medicaid. So it is a very state-specific game, and you really need to get local counsel. If your brother-in-law lives in another state halfway across the country, the answers he's getting will not apply to you. You need to get answers in your own state, in your own jurisdiction. Tell us about how to qualify for Medicaid. So qualification comes in, again, two categories. You have assets. And if the state allows you $2,000 in total assets, then you have to have your assets outside of the countable asset basket and in the exempt asset basket before you apply for Medicaid. And we use something called a Medicaid Asset Protection Trust to do that. And from that trust, you can retain certain rights, you could retain the income, and you can have certain strings and controls over the trust, but the assets inside that trust will not be countable when you apply for Medicaid. And the question then becomes, well, how far in advance do you need to create that trust? And Medicaid, this is a federal rule, has a five-year look-back period. So Medicaid eligibility has to be established five years in advance of the need. So you need to get out and get that trust in place five years before you apply for Medicaid so that the transfers of assets into the trust don't penalize you and render you ineligible. Early planning is absolutely the key. That said, New York and certain other states, the home care program is different. In New York, the home care program does not have a five-year look back. So your state, you need to know what the benefits are, you need to know what assets are exempt and what you can keep, and then you need to know what the impact of transfers of assets to the trust will be on your Medicaid eligibility. The idea is we wanna move those assets out of your name early, wait the five years, 
and then have Medicaid eligibility if and when that need arises. How can trusts help qualify people for Medicaid? Trusts are the tool that estate planners use every day. And we use them for a variety of purposes. I'm gonna give you two main categories of trusts and they're different in the eyes of the Medicaid rules. One is a revocable living trust. If you have a revocable trust, which means that you can tailor the trust, amend it, break it, revoke it, put assets in, take assets out. That trust is good for certain things like avoiding probate, managing assets if you become incapacitated, but because it's revocable, they can reach in and take those assets and count them against you when Medicaid is applied for. What you need for Medicaid purposes is an irrevocable trust. And we generally advise that someone else, probably your children, would be the trustees of that trust. You can keep, again, certain rights such as income from the trust, but the principal, the assets themselves, have to be walled off. So you cannot get direct access to the principal of that trust. And by doing that, that's the quid pro quo, those assets, because you can't get them directly, will not be available for Medicaid purposes. So we design the trusts with as many bells and whistles as we can to keep as much control for our clients as they can keep and still have those assets non-countable for Medicaid purposes. How do people plan for Medicaid coverage in their state? I think the first step is to develop a relationship with a qualified elder law attorney. And I, I can't emphasize this enough. We're in five states, but we're not in 45 states. We have a directory, uh, part of a group, it's called Elder Council. And if you want to get a qualified elder law attorney, I would highly recommend that you go to eldercouncil.com and there's a directory and you can go to that directory, put in your zip code and it'll tell you the attorneys in your area that practice elder law as a specialty and that have access to all the same documents that I have because we're all working on a common platform. We share ideas and we share our documents. So Elder Council is one place. You could look on the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys directory, and that's another place that you can find elder law attorneys if Elder Council doesn't work. Get that consultation, bring in the questionnaire, and most of us use a questionnaire. You be free, feel free to go to my website. We have questionnaires on there that we use for our clients, and that's pierrolaw.com and our questionnaire is up there. You can use that to organize yourself, get all the information, answer all the questions that that attorney will need. Sit down, have a thorough conversation, go through your situation, family, finances, etc., health needs, and then that attorney is gonna walk you through the process and lay out for you the options. You can't do this, it's hard to read a book and know how to do this because of all the nuances. In Medicaid law, I've learned over 35 years, there are exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions. And we, we see cases turn on one fact that you may miss. So get a good, thorough consultation with a qualified elder law attorney, and that's your best bet if you need to do the planning for long-term care. Christine, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Bruce. I understand you launched a new organization called To Inform Families First. Tell us about that. Well, it's not new. It's almost 14 years old, and it stands for TIFF's initiative, To Inform Families First. This is the first of its kind literally in the world, and it came about the night my daughter was killed, Tiffany Marie Olson, December 7th of 2005. Sorry, you heard that. She was involved in a fatal crash in Palmetto, Florida on US 19. Mm -hmm. Her accident happened at 7.01 p.m. At 11 p.m., the local newspapers had their story in print. I was at home watching a movie, drinking hot tea. I had no idea what was literally happening 15 minutes away, and I didn't find out for six and a half hours. That's horrible. Horrible? That's an average. That's an average time span before you, Bruce, or your family will be notified that someone you love has been hurt or killed in an accident. I had no idea, Christine. No idea. This is, you know, it's, it's amazing mm -hmm. um, for the simple fact that this, is, this idea came to me. 
So um, the night that my daughter was killed, I'm going to go through it because it's important that people understand exactly what will happen when emergencies happen. And this is for mom, dads, families, wherever you may live. So um, when this accident happened to my daughter, and like I said, she was killed on impact, law enforcement doesn't know who they're supposed to notify. So what they will do is they will look for your driver's license or identification card, and they will see an address on that. They're going to go to that address, and that is the information being given to law enforcement. So in, in, for instance, we're talking about elder care, but it's also anybody with a license. If I'm hurt in an accident at this moment, leaving this show, they're going to go to that address, but I am single and there is nobody home at that address. So what do you want law enforcement to do? So I came up with an idea in the days, weeks, months after my daughter was killed. I, I don't remember exactly how long it took, but Tiffany was on the back of a motorcycle. So she didn't have her purse with her. She had her driver's license. The license was in her back pocket. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in my brain, an idea sprung up, and it says, what if there was a way to tie an emergency contact to the driver's license or ID card? Okay? Mm -hmm. So I really didn't know what to do with that. I am a server at a restaurant. I'm not involved in government, law enforcement, or anything like that, but I had an idea. So I literally took my idea and wrote it down on a yellow legal pad. Wow. Because at the time, December 7th, 2005, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a computer. It just wasn't part of my function, you know? So I wrote an idea down and I asked people, I said, what do you think about putting emergency contacts in a driver's license? And people kind of thought and they said, wow, that's amazing. I said, I know. So, um, we started a petition drive, okay. and then I took it to Bill Galvano, who at the time, these, um, December's, um, well, 2005, Bill Galvano was a state representative, now state senator. When I took the idea to his office in Manatee County, um, he looked at me, he said, oh my God, this is amazing. He took it to Florida Highway Safety Motor Vehicles, and the state of Florida responded with, why haven't we done this? We're doing this immediately. Sometimes the simplest ideas oh are the best gosh. ones. Oh my gosh, well, the state of Florida knew this is a crisis. The national average, nationally, possibly worldwide, is six hours before a family, loved one, will be notified in an emergency. That's unacceptable. Let, that is, that was my word, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I said, this doesn't mm -hmm. even make sense. Right. Because my thought was, what if she was alive for any amount of time? This is my 22 year old baby. I would have wanted to have been with her. Um, so as we go into the show more, this is for every single person in existence with a license or idea, with the sole intention of providing law enforcement a tool to make sure they can reach families and loved ones in an emergency. Simple. So this is important for the elderly as well. Very, very much so. And um, I have a friend um, that I take care of in Bradenton. Her name is Eleanor. Mm -hmm. She's 88 years old. She still works at Publix. She has no one in the area. Mm -hmm. Her brother who is, um, has cancer is in New York. So if Eleanor is hurt in an accident, mm -hmm. they're going to show up, or a medical situation, heart, heart attack, stroke, sure. Alzheimer's, whatever, fall, law enforcement is going to show up and look at that license. They're mm -hmm. going to see her address. They're going to go to that address. But guess what? There's nobody home. And now how do I know who Eleanor's loved ones are? Do you know that can take days, weeks, longer? Sure. Some states have backlogs, like Philadelphia, they contacted me. They have backlogs of bodies because they can't find loved ones. That's a big deal with the homeless situation, sure. our veterans.
you know. So um, this is critical for every single breathing person. So um, that's that. So how many states now have this? Um, right now, currently, we're at about nine. Um, Texas is going to be the next state coming on board. Okay. Um, it is sitting in front of the governor as we speak. Mm -hmm. But the sole intention, this is one idea that has to be taken nationwide or worldwide. Because my purpose and passion as a human being on this planet is to make sure no one ever has to endure what I did that night. And when your viewers go to the website, please read the story. It's on the front page. Because these are the, this is the detailed event of what will happen if we don't change this very broken system. And it's really, other states are all eyes on Florida. They're watching Florida right now and they're like, my, look at the success. From a simple idea on a yellow legal pad, we're over 16 million registered in Florida. That's wow. catching attention of other states. And other states are like, we're doing it too. So the goal is to look for national sponsors, people that can make a difference in their state. I like to call them champions of change mm -hmm. because I could have died that night with my daughter right. and let this happen to other people, mm -hmm. but something in my soul stirred up and it says, do something. And I did, and it's hard, but I know there are viewers watching right now that can get, get on board with me Grab my hand, grab the torch, and let's get this done for the families in Florida, for the families in the United States of America, and take it around the world. How do Why people not? register for this? How does that so happen? So what they can do, literally, is that they can go um, to toinformfamiliesfirst.org, and it's going to be as simple as going to your phone. So we're going to post the website, to inform families first, and it stands for TIFF after my daughter's name, Tiffany. So that's where you're going to go. When you go onto the website on the phone, you simply click register, and I don't know, there you go. So these are all the states now participating. You simply click your state, and your DMV, BMV will open up immediately for you to register your emergency contact, right here, right on the spot. Click submit, and instantly that information travels into the magnetic strip on the driver's license. What happens in the case where an elderly person no longer drives, no longer has a driver's license? So we have an ID card. Ah. Okay. okay. State of Florida is really very much involved in this. Um, they are the biggest champion of change because they picked it up immediately, not even waiting a year to implement it. It literally mm -hmm. went into existence October 2nd of 2006. Tiffany was killed December 7th, 2005, not even a year later. State of Florida says we're ready to go. And now 16 million. So they're covering all the bases. So right now it's with a senior citizen's um, ID card, but it's also for the caregivers that are going back and forth. It's for the families. So if there's an elderly person hurt here in the state of Florida, how do they know that their loved ones are in another state? You have to register that senior citizen here, make sure that their families in another state are the emergency contacts listed so that medical teams in Florida, emergency rooms, whatever, mm -hmm. can contact that loved one and say, we have a situation going on. It's also critical for people that are traveling. So you're mm -hmm. not going to be at that license if you're traveling. We're going into hurricane season. Right. Hurricanes are big for seniors, it's big for me. I didn't care for Irma very much last year. She was not my favorite person. Mm -hmm. So like I said, Bruce, this is for everyone. Mm -hmm. But it only works if you're active in registering your emergency contacts and then contacting me and say, Christine, I'm here to help. We need national sponsors to pick up the torch and get this again um, to other states. You know, like I said, the world, why, why stop it? Just the States, you know, United States of America, take it everywhere because families are waiting at this very minute. There's an emergency happening right now and a family will not be notified six hours. What are you going to do about it? I think that what you're doing is so important and I hope that people really listen to you and I hope that all 50 states have this 
soon and then next the world. Absolutely, absolutely. How can people reach you? Uh, my contact information is uh, Christine at helptiff.org, H-E-L-P-T-I-F-F.org. My phone number is 941-795-1869. And the website, again, is toinformfamiliesfirst.org. Contact information and registration is right on there. And I just want to end with, um, on the home page of the website, Sheriff Rick Wells of Manatee County, who is a huge advocate, uh, did an interview with one of uh, the TIF um, uh, members. And he explained in his 28 years of service in law enforcement what it was like before TIF's initiative and what it's like now with TIF's initiative. Take a, you, you can share that too, but take a look at that short interview. It's three minutes long and it will definitely speak to your heart. And then there's also another short um, video on there, 30 seconds, that shows just how TIF's initiative will work for you and your family. Christine, thank you very much for being thank on you, our Bruce. show. Thank you, Bruce. I'm so glad to be here. The realization that it is time to move mom or dad, or both from their house, is a stressful one. In other episodes, we will have experts tell us about options, assisted living, nursing home, or other options. Today, we will address the issues surrounding the need to suddenly sell mom and dad's home when they are not capable of doing so themselves. So what are the unique issues challenging caregivers when faced with this dilemma? I am pleased to introduce you to Lisa McBride. Lisa is an expert real estate agent that advises families regarding this issue frequently. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Bruce. So what are your thoughts about that issue? Well, it comes up quite often, um, and most people that you asked about the unique things that come up, I think the biggest thing is just the unknown and a feeling of being completely overwhelmed right. by where do I start? What's the first thing to do? Who do I contact? Um, and also knowing the value of the property. So uh, we get calls regarding that a lot. Um, where do I start? What happens when the caregivers are in another state, for example, and this comes up? How do you manage that situation? Well, I like to start with finding out who, who, are, who is the caregiver and right. how many siblings are usually involved because many times there's more than one person. Right. And as siblings, um, it's good to appoint somebody to be a point of contact. Sure. Um, of course, I talk to everyone throughout the process, but usually having one person is is good to kind of run things by okay. um, and to take the lead on that and so that's the first thing that i would tell families to coordinate is who's going to be your point of contact and then um, we're going to talk about what's the next step on cleaning out the home not cleaning out the home obviously the first concern is the mom and dad is making sure they're in a safe place they're being taken care of um, whatever the case may be, because we, I, I see this as two different things because sometimes it's mom and dad are going into a nursing home or assisted living. Sometimes they've passed away. So two different issues, but both of them extremely stressful. Of course. Do you require a power of attorney when you're dealing with the caregivers? Uh, well, there, there's a real estate power of attorney. And right. again, this is going to depend on if there's if they've passed away or not, because then that's part of the trust or the will of who gets, who's the executor and who gets to sign. Most trusts have it set up where all parties have to sign in, um, in the case of selling a property. And if it is a matter of um, the parents just are in assisted living or assisted care, they can give a power of attorney, but there's steps involved to do that. Okay. Tell us about this. Suddenly this happens where you've got either the death of parents or that they're being quickly put into a nursing home or assisted living. Um, and now the caregivers want to quickly sell the home. It may seem like it's a panic sale or a forced sale. Uh, does this drive the price down? No. And first of all, I would, okay. I would, 
I would caution everyone, you don't, you don't have, it, it depends on why there's a for, why they're quickly wanting to do this. Okay. So you, you mentioned quickly. I would really ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the immediate need? Um, I wanna get the best price for their home, you know, the best value. There are things that can be done. Um, first of all, are you gonna sell the home with all of its personal belongings in there? How are you going to clean it out? What, what are the steps? Of course, you can, you know, you can rush it onto the market, but you're going to get the most amount of money with a little bit of preparation. And I'm not saying that you have to wait six months. We we have information and people to contact to help us in a fairly rapid uh, pace mm -hmm. to get the home ready to put on the market. What's the general length of period of time it takes in those situations? to list the home and then ultimately sell it? Um, well, I would say 30 to 60 days, depending on how quickly, again, how quickly the heirs um, take action. Uh, because they have their lives too. You know, when they're 40, 50, 60 years old and they're taking care of their parents, they still have their own lives. So it, it really depends on when they can be here, if they're accessible, you know, things like that. We have a situation in our family where there is a home that's in another country. Oh, wow. And it's being sold. And the problem has been that the agent has not done anything to really move the home. In fact, we wonder whether the agent really even cares. How do you protect the family in a situation where you're not sure that that's the right agent? Um. That's a good question. I guess I would start asking a lot of questions. Why do you feel he's not doing anything? Um, I would go a little deeper. To sell any home, whether it's here in Sarasota or anywhere in the nation, you have to have a good working relationship with your agent. If you don't feel that you have the right agent, it's okay to find somebody else. But I would ask a lot of questions right. um, and dig a little deeper because this is, selling a home is very personal, right. and obviously selling your parents' home is extremely personal. Right. And I don't know the market in other areas. I can only talk to the market here. Sure. We should be able to sell the home, if it's priced correctly, right. in 30 days, 30 to 90 days. Now that's, mm -hmm. I know that sounds fast, but it can be done if the home is, is prepared. If it's really prepared. Yeah. What are the steps necessary to begin the sales process when you have a caregiver involved who's now stepping in for perhaps their parents' sale of the home? Uh, the first thing is preparing the home okay. and making sure that all the personal belongings that they want are out of the home. Uh, you know, there's going to be some, some items, especially with technology, computers, paperwork, things that, you know, there's just, those are just the the main things that need to get out. Then there's gonna be personal items, photos, different things that you wanna take out. So the first step is really kind of doing a quick run through of the home of what you want or what needs to be removed. So that, that would be my first step. Then the second step would be like, what needs to go because it's just, I hate to say this, but just kind of junk, you know, you know, we all have those piles of things that just we need to get rid of, or they're not worth anything anymore. You know, there's just, old things, so then I would take those out. For some people, I would suggest getting a roll off dumpster for like one day and just start dumping it. Okay. Um, that sounds very impersonal, I understand. However, most of the things any of us have in our home, whether we're elderly or 35, aren't much value to many people. Right. And so we need to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just a one day of just taking everything out is the best thing to do. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add? that there's a lot of people here to help and that it doesn't have to be overwhelming. What I hear most often is I don't know where to start or who to contact. As a professional real estate agent, we have a list of people that we work with and we have mm -hmm. lots of help. Sure. Thank you very much, Lisa. How do people reach you? Um, you can call me. Uh, my phone number is 941373. 5880 or email me at lisa mcbride at kw.com i would like to thank our experts for appearing on this episode of taking care of mom and dad 
If you have specific questions, we invite you to send them by email to info at talkshowfactory.com. We will do our best to have our experts address them in a future episode. Until then, this is Bruce Stout saying thank you and have a great day. <laughs>